we're going to ask you to suspend your disbelief and leave your credulity at the door for this collection of video delights. We're going to be exploring the very strangest of finds, the ones that leave you questioning the evidence of your eyes and searching for rational explanations in places where rationality doesn't exist. We've got a lot of weirdness to get through, so let's dive right into it. Who or what was the Lapido child, and might it have been a hybrid born of a union between a human and a Neanderthal? The answer to that question is maybe, but let's look at the facts. In 1998, archaeologists found the bones of a four-year-old child buried in a rock shelter in Lapido Valley, Lisbon, Portugal. The discovery represented the first complete Paleolithic skeleton find in the history of the Iberian Peninsula. After completing a full analysis of the skeleton, scientists concluded that it was about 23,100 years old and had the lower arms and chin of a human, but the jaw of a Neanderthal. This is a troubling finding for a lot of historians who refuse to consider that humans and Neanderthals became one race by interbreeding and instead insist that Neanderthals became extinct due to a variety of environmental factors, including the evolutionary success of modern humans. According to them, Neanderthals couldn't have coexisted with humans in Iberia any more recently than 28,000 years ago. It's impossible to argue with the scientific evidence presented by the Lapido child, though, and so it seems that mainstream scientific ideas about how and when the Neanderthals disappeared are wrong. You'd have thought that the discovery of a new pyramid in Egypt would have made international news, but this one escaped the attention of the world's media. Nevertheless, a previously undiscovered tomb was recently found in Darshur, best known for being home to the Bent Pyramid. What's left of the pyramid was found beneath a large ancient quarry and included a passage that would have once led from the entrance to the pyramid to an underground complex right at the heart of the monument. However, the entrance was sealed up with enormous limestone blocks. It took three days to move the stone and gain access to the burial chamber inside it, at which point the archaeologists got a big shock. It seems that someone broke into the chamber, stole everything that was valuable, vandalized it, and then sealed it all up again around 4,000 years ago. The vandalism means that we'll never know who was buried inside the tomb or who it was built for, but that's not the mystery here. The mystery is how someone managed to break into an Egyptian pyramid all that time ago, do so much damage, and then get out again without leaving so much as a trace of their presence. Our next discovery takes us to Jordan, where archaeologists say they found a 9,000-year-old shrine standing in the desert. The discovery, which was made by a combined team of Jordanian and French archaeologists, happened at a remote Neolithic site near Amman, which is already known to archaeologists because of the presence of desert kites, a kind of ancient hunting trap in the area. Based on the proximity of the desert kites, it's likely that the shrine was used to pray to the gods for a successful hunt, give thanks for a successful hunt, or both. The shrine is accompanied by a hearth, an altar, and a pair of standing stones covered in carvings of anthropomorphic figures and an illustration of a desert kite. Marine shells have been scattered across the area in an act that presumably had some kind of ritual function or symbolism. No shrine of this age has ever been found in such a well-preserved condition in this part of the world before, so it might yet shed new light on the culture, religion, and artistic expression of these nomadic hunters. In 2007, a group of Danish contractors working on Zealand Island to replace sewage pipes unearthed a startling discovery they found a skull beneath a building that formerly belonged to a butcher. They initially mistook it for a typical human skull, which would have been a frightening find regardless, but upon closer investigation, it appeared to be unlike anything they'd ever seen before. It's far too large to be a human skull, and it doesn't resemble the cranium of any known animal on the planet. The skull was brought to the University of Copenhagen for examination, and scientists there estimated its age to be roughly 800 years old, 
but they couldn't say what creature it came from. To add to the mystery, the pipe it was discovered inside was installed less than a century ago. The island of Sealand is famous for being the former headquarters of the Order of Pegasus Light, a group of writers and poets that purportedly included William Shakespeare and Thomas Jefferson among its membership. Their responsibilities were reported to involve guarding and protecting alien guests' bones. Could this be confirmation of the cult's existence? What else could it be if not that? Doodling genitalia on a wall, a piece of paper, or just about anywhere they're able to draw one is some people's idea of the funniest joke in the world. It might be crude and juvenile, but it's also one of the oldest human habits in the world. As far as archaeologists are aware, the oldest so-called erotic graffiti can be found on an Aegean island called Astipalaya. The graffiti includes enormous phalluses and written descriptions of sexual acts, some of which are impressively detailed. The carvings were created around 2,500 years ago, and archaeologists are very impressed by them. The reason they're impressed, though, has less to do with their subject matter and more to do with the written inscriptions. The Acropolis had not yet been built in Greece 2,500 years ago, and it's long been assumed that literacy was a trait that only the ruling classes possessed. But these carvings appear to have been created by everyday people. One of them says, Nicositimos was here mounting Timiona. That's the sort of thing that a pair of love-struck teenagers might scrawl on a wall today. Speaking of ancient graffiti, our next find is the Axalaminos graffiti. It was discovered in 1857 during the excavation of a building called the Doma Skeletiana on Palatine Hill in Rome, Italy, but has since been removed for its own protection and now resides within the Palatine Museum. It's generally thought that the graffiti includes a depiction of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, which would make it the oldest known pictorial representation of that event in the world. Archaeologists and scientists agree that it was probably sketched onto the wall somewhere close to the year 200. The quality of the artwork is poor, but it shows a man worshipping a donkey-headed human who has been nailed onto a cross. The image is accompanied by an equally poor Greek inscription which, when translated into English, reads, Alexamenos worships his god. Taken as a whole, the graffito seems to have been drawn as a means of mocking an early Christian by the name of Alexamenos. Whether this was intended to be a bit of banter between friends or something more sinister is something that we'll probably never know. We'll stick with the theme of the written word and inscribed image for now as we check out the West Car Papyrus. These days, you'll find it on display under low light conditions inside the Egyptian Museum of Berlin, Germany, although there's an ongoing campaign to have it returned home to Egypt. The papyrus is an ancient Egyptian text that contains five separate stories about miracles allegedly performed by magicians and priests. The papyrus appears to be a handwritten account of tales that were told in person within the royal court of King Khufu, who was also known as King Cheops. That explains why the West Car Papyrus is sometimes also known as the Tale of King Cheops Court. Its more commonly used name comes from the fact that it was supposedly found by the British explorer Henry Westcar during his travels through Egypt in 1824, although Westcar didn't record the circumstances in which he discovered it. If he'd done so, we might have more information about who wrote it and why. The name of the author isn't recorded anywhere in the text. Without that extra information, we can't say whether the stories are supposed to be events that actually happened or merely stories told to amuse the court. There are many places on Earth where archaeologists might reasonably expect to find ancient Roman coins if they did a little digging. The ruins of a Japanese castle would not be one of those places, and yet that's where some were found in September 2016. The discovery comes from Katsuren Castle in Okinawa, which was built during the 12th century, but has been in ruins since the 15th. The 4th century copper coins, of which there are only four, are in poor condition, 
but X-ray analysis of their surfaces has revealed that several of them bear the likeness of Constantine the Great. A fifth coin was also found at the site, but it comes from the Ottoman Empire and isn't thought to be linked to the Roman discoveries. The question of how the Roman coins came to be here is a mystery that's unlikely ever to be solved, but we're allowed to speculate. The Okinawa of the 4th century was in the process of becoming an important trading city and had strong links to China and Southeast Asia. Could the coins have made their way to either of those places through trade and from there came to be traded on into Japan? It's possible. In June 2015, a resident of St. John in New Brunswick, Canada, decided to perform a long overdue clear out of the contents of his attic. When he found what appeared to be old religious relics, he called his daughter. She called an archaeologist. The archaeologist called a museum and the museum called Interpol. That's how much intrigue this discovery generated. These gorgeously decorated artifacts are called reliquaries, and inside each of them is a bone. Traditionally, the bones are supposed to be those of a saint. The owner of the home they were found in has no idea how they got there but it appears that he might have had the long-lost bones of a Catholic saint in his attic for decades. He believes a German family might have owned the home before him, but he's had no luck attempting to get in contact with them. It's possible that the relics, which are between 200 and 500 years old, were looted during the Second World War. Regrettably, there's no information to say which particular saint is supposed to be partially enclosed within the reliquaries, but that might be immaterial as reliquaries rarely contain who they're supposed to contain anyway. A very long time ago, perhaps as long ago as the 7th century, somebody in Ireland decided to carve a lengthy, elaborate ogham inscription into the metacarpal bone of a sheep and then leave it inside the fortification of Caracumon in Tully Common, County Clare, where it was eventually found by archaeologists in 1934. Ogham is a very early medieval alphabet, used mostly to write the Old Irish language. Only around 400 Ogham inscriptions are known to still exist in the world, and the language isn't fully understood because letters are sometimes exchanged with so-called magical symbols. That's the case with the Tully Common Bone, which has never been translated. Experts have been able to identify the Ogham signs for C and S on either side of the bone, and perhaps an M and the sign for the sound EA in the middle. It's possible that the inscription was never supposed to be understood, and may instead have been used for magical or ritual purposes. Most Ogham inscriptions are carved into stone columns or slabs. It's extremely rare to find one etched into something as small as a sheep bone, which is why this is such a precious find. Many of South America's greatest archaeological sites and structures are linked to the Inca's creativity, though we can't always be sure it was the Inca who built them. The famed 12-angled stone in the palace of the Archbishop in Cusco, Peru, is a perfect example of this. The carved green diorite in the Lienzo Pietro wall is a precision-engineered stone. The Palace of Hatun Rumiak was previously encompassed by the inward-leaning wall, but it was demolished long ago. The 12-angled stone could be considered a work of architectural brilliance, even if it wasn't part of the wall, because it was built without the use of mortar or binding substances. We have no idea how each stone was carved to the right shape to fit with the stones around it. The workmanship is of such high quality that there isn't a single flaw anywhere, even centuries after it was completed. Even a solitary piece of paper is too thick to slide between the stones because they are so tightly packed. The 12-angled stone is the wall's defining feature, yet almost every stone in the wall is an outstanding work of art. Even if the narrative surrounding a discovery turns out to be false, the discovery itself might be exciting. We provide the Kinderhook plates as proof, which were named after the location where they were supposedly discovered in the United States in May 1843. While exploring a burial mound in the Illinois town, reputable merchant Robert Wiley allegedly discovered the six plates, together with charred stone and human bones. 
It's never been fully explained why a merchant would dig into a burial mound in the first place. A local man who helped Wiley with the dig took the plates home, and when they were cleaned, they were discovered to be adorned with Egyptian-style hieroglyphs. When the plates caught the notice of Joseph Smith, the father of the Mormon religion, their profile soared. Smith professed to have translated the plates, as was typical of the man. He said the bones belonged to a descendant of Ham, Noah's son and a member of the Egyptian monarch's bloodline. Until 1980, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints maintained that the plates were genuine. As for the truth, Wiley had them forged in a blacksmith shop just before feigning their discovery. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.